Kid, seriously? Welcome to a laconic and sure to be pithy return of the Kid Seriously Show. This is the only podcast around that leaves you as the learner, but returns as the master. Every so often we get to get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars and other parts of the world that tickle our fancy, answer some questions that Kid Seriously got, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. Speaking of masters, Jedi and otherwise, for better or for worser, in public and in private, we have our heroes, the Knightsel Brothers. To my left, a fan of the clown of It, but not of Stephen King's writing, it's Luke Neitzel. And to my right, in the nether reaches of the Golden State, it's the Joker himself, Mark Neitzel. Stuck in the middle with you, dear listener, it's Maya Madrid. Boys, how are you? I'm good. I'm just not a fan of uh, giant turtles controlling the world, or child orgies, or any of those other things that you end up having to read when... Stephen King makes a, a terrible book. But that aside, I have been having a fun week. I've been seeing uh, Lady Madrid and Boom yeah. every every night this well, week. Oh, no, it's getting weird here. Uh-oh, oh, yeah. You need to, you need to put that our into context. Kids, kids are at the same day camp, so we see each other at pickup time, and our daughters drew pictures of each other and exchanged them. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't hear about that. I haven't been seeing her very much uh, recently because of that camp. So Yeah, she told me that she cries at night because you're never around. You're lucky. <laughs> I am lying. <laughs> Mark, what's going on with you, man? Uh, well, first off, I wanted to say thank you to both of you. Um, after my performance last week, I, I was really feeling down on myself, but at the rose ceremony, you gave me the final rose. I'm, I'm back here for another week, and I'm, I'm really just hoping to make it to a, at least a go-home-to-meet-the-family week. It's well, my big hope here. We are on a show-by-show contract, so uh, we will keep you posted with that. But once again, we're glad to have you back, at least for this episode. As for me, uh, we talked about Case File before, back when it was just Luke and I, and I just listened to a three-part series they did on Ross Ulbricht and Silk Road, which is fantastic. If you out there are a fan of true crime and not listening to Case File, you are missing out. Mark, I wanted to ask, were you around, that happened in your neck of the woods, was that a big deal where you're from, that was the Silk Road guy who got busted for the underweb, black web, or whatever it's called? Oh, oh God, yes, it was huge here in San Francisco. Since I don't really truck myself in the uh, tech community, it wasn't a big deal around where I work, uh, but yeah, I had friends who were you know, kind of peripherally in that world and talking about a lot, and it was in all of the news, and yeah, it's, it was a big deal. It hadn't changed anything. I'm sure there's 30 new websites up and running right. to take its place, but yeah. Well, it was an exciting episode and an exciting series of case file, nonetheless. I suppose we should uh, we should probably get to the news. Luke's giving me that look. <laughs> Reportedly, filming for episode 9 has begun, though there has not been a direct mention from the mouse. That being said, MovieWeb has released a ton of speculation that comes pouring out from filming, or this could all be total BS created just to get clicks. Either way, gentlemen, I'd like to discuss three major nuggets from the article and for you to rate each one's likelihood on a scale of 1 to 4. 4 would mean that it's absolutely happening and that anyone who might think of wild speculation as spoilers should leave now and never come back until the next episode, of course. Three would mean it's probable, as in it is probable that the San Jose earthquakes will finish last in the West. Two, <laughs> two is unlikely, as in it is unlikely that we can make it through this podcast without Luke talking down to someone somewhere. Or one, finally, which means no chance in hell, which is the chances of watching Monday Night Football when friend of the show Gary has the remote. Does everybody understand? So you're going to rank these four to one on the likelihood of what uh, what you think each of these three topics? It's a hard concept, but I I think I'll, I'll I wanted to go really slow through. for you guys. Appreciate I'm, it. I'm doing the math longhand right now, but I think I'll have it by the time you start seeing stuff. All right, the first rumor I would like you to rate harkens back to last week's episode with our riveting discussion about Yavin Four. Abrams has allegedly taken cast and crew back to England for those Rebel Alliance garage scenes that we're so fond of in order to make like The Last Jedi and kill the past, destroying the stronghold, and providing something shocking to the viewers. On a scale of 1 to 4, how likely will we see the Masasi Temple getting its sweet redemption for what happened to the first Death Star? I'll say 2, 
Because who really cherishes a Yavin bunker enough to have it be a statement that you destroy it? Bro, there are so many people who cherish weird things about this series on the internet. You need to go on. Well, sure, but you, but then you could destroy anything that's ever been associated with Star Wars. I mean, you could you could destroy little blonde, curly haired children because someone is adamantly in love with Caravan of Courage, like. I- I think I that's just, slightly different. I think you're kind of... Oh, there's different. someone on the internet, check it out, who really is upset about how little respect Caravan of Courage gets in canon. I, I just don't think this is that important of those that things. That was me in a tweet, and that was a joke. <laughs> nice. I, I just don't think these are, these are... This is the type of thing that makes any type of statement. Yavin 4 is not important enough to do that. If they're going to make a statement like that, they're going to do something bigger and bolder than that. If if that is their version of burning the past, that's pretty meek and mild, in my opinion. So I'll, I'll put it as a, a two. two. Mark, what you got over there? I'm going four, because if you're going to this nothing planet, why would you not reference the one thing people are really going to know about it? It's there's no point in doing it otherwise. Just go to a completely new planet. Now, I'm not saying I'm excited about it. I'd rather they went back to maybe Hoth or even Dagobah. But, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. Um, it's a four. For me, it's a three. Oh, for me, it's a three. Um, I think, basically, I think it's likely if you're going to go there, especially in the first act of the film, and do something um, that has some meaning, I think it's a place that people will recognize, and I, I think it'll it'll put the, the heroes in a dangerous situation. And for those of us who are knee-deep into the extended universe, it's Poe's home planet. And so to get that character a little bit more fleshed out and a little screen time for Oscar Isaac is always a good thing for me. So I'm going to go ahead and say this is three. Number two, in an almost completely opposite thought, the next rumor is that J.J. Abrams and Disney are concerned by large numbers of fans, quote-unquote large numbers, and their backlash to The Last Jedi, and are hoping to incorporate a little help from their friend. Reportedly, Abrams is working closely with George Lucas to ensure that this movie unifies the fan base and brings order back to the galaxy. Rumors were that he gave some help on Rogue One and visited the set of Rogue Two, Solo, a Star Wars anthology film. How likely is it that George Lucas is getting his fingers back in the Star Wars pie? I'll go with a a three on this, but not kind of in the sense that you're framing it. I'm going with a three that they're involving him because they want him to be another tool in their arsenal that they can use for promotion. It's good to have him as someone you can count on for publicity and things like that. I don't think they're letting him have a major input in any type of story. Just for clarification, as people know, I've been a critic of The Last Jedi, and I think that's what Luke is pointing out. I'm framing it how MovieWeb framed it, just for the sake oh, of... Oh, I, I didn't even mean it like that. I, I, I think... I just wanted to explain why I'm giving it a three, not because I think they're giving him major story control or taking his input that seriously. I think they're just trying to make him happy so he doesn't go on 60 Minutes and call them slave traders. <laughs> I I honestly think that's that's more what it's about. So I think he is involved, but I don't think he's going to have major story input that'll make much difference. As you both may or may not know, I live very close to Skywalker Ranch, and so I've got a lot of real deep knowledge of this world and... Well, and- What's going on with Lucas that you don't have access to? You you do you do have the distinction of having been at a stoplight next to him. That is correct. <laughs> no, I think you're thinking of Snoop Dogg, actually. Oh, um, I get those two mixed up. Yeah. Um, I'm going with a one because two things. First off, I don't think anybody, aside from nerds on 4chan and Reddit, give a shit about what nerds on 4chan and Reddit think about Star Wars. Uh, It's a lot of people trying to inflate their sense of self-worth and value to the franchise by saying, oh, we're being accommodated uh, by Disney and Abrams. Uh, As far as Lucas's involvement, where I'm tapping into my deep-seated knowledge here, I don't think he really wants to have a lot to do with it. And I don't think that they have... A chip to play in really bringing him in. I mean, what are you going to pay him? He's got more money than God. You're going to subject him to another round of criticism and people screaming at him about how he ruined their childhood by putting in a Gungan in episode nine. 
I don't think he's. I don't think he wants to deal with it. I don't think he cares enough anymore, and I think he's too burned by what happened with the prequels. So, I don't think he comes within a metric mile of this production. I, I agree with Mark here. In the words of uh, friend of the show Vince McMahon, "No chance, no chance in hell." Let's move on to the final one. As you may recall, guys, Maz Kanata is Luke Neitzel's favorite portion of both The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. The rumor is that Maz is going to play a huge role in helping Rey rebuild the Anakin Skywalker lightsaber. You may recall also that Rey originally came into possession of the lightsaber when she visited Maz's reggae bar in The Force Awakens. Episode 9 is rumored to explain Kanata's possession of the weapon, and Movie Web says that Lando returned to Bespin after Empire Strikes Back and found it in a lost and found via the Ugnaughts. Gentlemen, a double-decker. How likely is Maz to have an expanded role, and what are the chances that this is how she got the lightsaber in the first place? Look, I'll let you take this one first. So I'll say three that she has an expanded role. I don't think they're going to rebuild that lightsaber. I think that would be a really dumb move narratively because the symbolism of breaking that lightsaber is a summation of what they were doing in Last Jedi, and I don't think they're reversing course that quickly. So I, I she's obviously going to have a lightsaber, but they're not just going to rebuild the old one. They'll probably throw her in there because J.J. Abrams seems to love her, and she's an easy exposition dump when they need her to be one because that's kind of her purpose. And as far as the Ugnaughts and finding it in a lost and found box, yeah, sure, why not? I mean... I don't really give a shit how they found the lightsaber, to be honest. I'm going to piggyback off the end of your answer there, Luke, and say on the who gives a shit scale of one to four, I give this a 36. (laughs) I could not care less about this question in any way. If you paid me a million dollars to care about this question, I still couldn't. Well, that's because you live in San Francisco. That's basically what your rent costs. (laughs) Um, I think she's going to have a huge role. Look, this is Abrams based this character off of his favorite teacher growing up. And I, and I imagine that he's a little bit burned that she had such a negative reception, uh, by so many people, especially after the last Jedi. And I think she will have a huge role. I agree with what Luke said about the lightsaber. It would be stupid to rebuild the lightsaber, but she still has those kyber crystals. And I'd like her to make those kyber crystals into a two, a double wielded lightsaber, similar to the staff that she has in the force awakens. Um, so I don't think it's likely the stuff with Lando is going to play out how they said it is. I think it's more them getting clicks, but it's fun to think about. All right, moving on. It's time for Lithuania's favorite game show. It's Am I Right or Am I Wrong? Here's how our two-player game works. There's seven questions. Our champion, Luke Neitzel, is going to go first in the first round, while our challenger, that's me, will go first in the second round and vice versa in a serpentine style befitting the fairness of a fantasy draft, but also our multiple heads of government. At the end of each question, the point will go to whoever's correct, or if their answers are similar, whichever one the moderator likes better. If there's a draw, there's a draw. There's no overtime here. You need to win it in regulation last week. Luke was able to earn a draw against his brother and keep the title. This week, it will be Mark in moderation as I, Maya Madrid, attempt to take five smooth stones from the closest brook and load them into my sling. Mark, do your worst. Okay. I'm uh, pleased that you brought up Vince McMahon because that leads perfectly into our first question. Question number one. Last Monday, the WWE announced that on October 8th, they will air Evolution the first ever all-women's pay-per-view. In honor of this momentous event, who is the greatest female wrestler of all time? Oh, man. The, the greatest of all time. I am going off. I guess I'll go with, with Lita. Damn you. Because <laughs> Lita, Lita was um, a, good, a good representation of what female wrestlers versus female wrestlers could do. She, she was acrobatic. She was entertaining. She was high-flying. She could still wrestle with the men like she did with S.A. Rios and the Hardy Boys more famously in Edge. But then she could also go in the women's division and roll through it, which is a contrast to some other women wrestlers like China, who the WWE tried to basically position as men. Um, Lita was able to cover both categories and... What was it? A neck injury on Witchblade that ended her career, which is terrible. But you know, as someone who who primarily watched in the the eighties and then started watching again in the nineties, that would be the person who jumps out at me. 
Obviously, I'm at a disadvantage here going second. I think that was a great answer. Ob- Lita is a fantastic wrestler and probably the best technical wrestler. I will give you an alternate answer of Trish Stratus. And the reason why is everybody needs a great heel in wrestling to put them over. And I think being a great technical wrestler isn't enough. You need that sort of atmosphere. And what Trish Stratus brought was she brought that sort of person that you couldn't like. So that got Lita over. And so I'm going to go with Trish Stratus. Thank you. I am giving the point to Maya because Trish not only had everything that he said, but she had to also overcome truly horrible plot lines where basically all that was being displayed was her uh, body. And I think to come back from that and become a respectable wrestler is a barrier Lita didn't have to cross. So point goes to Maya. All right. Question number two. This is exciting, isn't it? It's, I'm, I'm on the edge of Drama. <laughs> Far-right internet troll oh, were God. successful in getting James Gunn fired as the director of Guardians of the Galaxy 3 after digging up some old and arguably tasteless jokes he made on Twitter. Assuming that we can't get him back via impassioned speeches by Dave Batista and online internet petitions, who do you think should take over as the uh, helmsman of Guardians of the Galaxy 3? Well, it's not going to be Ron Howard, I will say that. Um, You know, you want somebody really fun. You want somebody who's exciting. But the the, the best answer for it is either James Gunn himself or Taika Waititi. But I think that's a cop-out answer. Um, For me, I think what would probably happen is that they'd go safe and go uh, with the, uh, the, the Russos just to try to to save face but i don't have a lot of uh, a lot of excitement for what's going to come next i mean it's basically james gunn made that group if you read the comics and and mark may have uh james gunn makes that movie the movie is better than the comic books in my opinion so i think that what you want to avoid is just trying to do a james gunn imitation because i think that'll end up being hollow and falling flat but you still need these characters to be quirky so this is why you want to have Christopher Guest make it as a mockumentary-style superhero movie. A different version of a superhero we movie we've ever seen. I yield. I yield. <laughs> and a, a Eugene Lovey guaranteed cameo. I yield. I, I, I actually had Edgar Wright, uh, the original oh. uh, Helmsman for Ant-Man, and who uh, really impressed me with Baby Driver, but that Christopher Guest, that is a way better answer yeah. i'm on the ropes now that was this nearly a knockout to 11 all right so you're lucky we don't have tko rules yeah that would be bad question number three r kelly released a 19 minute song titled i admit which is a response to a year's worth of accusations accusations excuse me over sexual assault and holding women as sex slaves i think we can all agree that this is a man who deserves being punched in the face repeatedly by his cellmate <laughs> Which celebrity would you most like to deliver his or her version of prison justice on Mr. Kelly? You know, so the the first thing that that jumps into my mind is is kind of like a Dave Batista type, you know, giant brute monster, but that's that's not really what I want to happen to him because this is a guy who 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 preyed on girls, underage young girls. So I, I want Ellen Page to to dish out justice on him, much hard candy style, you know, in that movie where she she plays a kid turning a table on a, on a child molester. I I want someone that he would see as a victim he could control to uh, to turn the tables on him and give him a little bit back of the decades worth of pain he inflicted on young women. Interesting for uh, me for me um, the uh, the the R and B. Uh, music scene when whenever there was somebody who had to sort of lay down the law 20 years ago it was suge knight suge knight was always the person who kind of got his hands dirty when other people weren't willing um as a record producer and as a as muscle and so i would like to see suge knight in there i believe I, i believe he's already in prison so that would make it a little bit easier is he alive i don't know i don't know either i think so (laughs) he is still alive he is in prison i believe awaiting trial uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little torn on this one because there is the practicality that Jeremiah presents with somebody who's already in prison, um, and that takes care of a lot of the logistics. 
of the matter. <laughs> but I do like Luke's kind of ironic take on it. So mm, I'm 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 gonna have to go with Luke. Um, not only because I'm a big fan of irony, but also because I've got a feeling that Maya's gonna take the next question. So I want to keep it interesting. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> So, our current score is Maya 1, Luke 2. Uh-oh. Question number four. After a hiatus of several years, Marvel announced at Comic-Con this last weekend that they are bringing back the title Uncanny X-Men, which they have not put out in several years, instead favoring titles like X-Men Blue, X-Men Gold. So, in the spirit of this... Who is the worst character to ever be on an Uncanny X-Men team? Oh my goodness. There's so many. I know. I think for me, in my own personal taste, um, I would have to go... God, I can't think. I'll spit something out. <laughs> That's what happens when you go first. I know. This is a bummer. I wish I had gone second on this question. I'm going to say, uh, in my opinion, Rachel Gray. I think she was a cheap knockoff of Jean, and I think it was just them filling uh, a space, and I never felt like she really got her footing, and I never cared for the character. Um, Jean was that character. If you want to bring back Jean, bring back Jean. And if you don't want to bring back Jean, don't bring back Jean. But Rachel's been somewhere in between, and she's been that way the, since her creation, I think, which was in the, in the mid-'80s. And we're talking, you know, 30-some years later, and she's still rudderless. I mean, she just had a new code name. I can't even remember what it was. It was that stupid. Um, I think it that was... was in... Prestige. Oh, that's right. Prestige. I, I just... I've always kind of felt bad for that character. And uh, that's my answer. Okay, Luke. Oh, But let me ask you a question about Rachel Gray. Yeah. Can she light your blood on fire? <laughs> because I know someone who can. Are you talking about Adam X? Adam X the Extreme! I didn't know he was uncanny. Though. I don't even care what... Whatever. He's involved in an X title. He's covered in knives and pouches, and he lights your blood on fire. He is by far the worst thing that they have done. Can I ask a clarifying question? And this, is, this can be completely separate of your decision, Mark. Um, is Adam X so bad and so far away from the 90s that he's actually become cool? Because I've heard people make that argument. That people love him now. Uh, yes, there actually is sort of a kitsch factor uh, nowadays. Um, in fact, I remember uh, one, um, now not that recent now because I'm actually really old, but uh, actually a comic from a little while ago written by Matt Fraction where a bunch of mutants are sitting around a table discussing how they're going to handle some uh, anti-mutant rally that's going on in the city. And Adam's there pounding on the table saying, fuck shit up! <laughs> <laughs> I also, I, I think there are people out there who would say Sunspot to this answer, and I just want to really? make it clear that I love Sunspot. I love that beginning arc right at the beginning of X-Men when he just basically double birds the whole world and then just leaves. And I just love that character, so... Sunspot but, would never be my answer. I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised, but then again, maybe not. You both got this question wrong. Oh. Oh. The actual answer... If you say Gambit, I'm going to cry. Don't say Gambit. No, no. Gambit's fine. I like... You're talking to the world's biggest Girl Gambit thing. Uh, no. The worst X-Men of all time, X... A prostitute who's mutant oh, powers to yes. the pleasure centers Stacey of a person's X. brain yes. and fought in a bikini. Yep, you're right. I'm not I'm aware of that character. I'm so embarrassed I didn't come up with Stacey X. That's the answer to everything. You're right. Okay. Question five. Quentin Tarantino is currently making a movie about characters peripheral to the Manson family murders called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This movie stars Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt as stuntmen working at the Spawn Ranch where the Manson family was squatting. Now, if you're going to be forced to listen to Charles Manson deliver a 25-minute Tarantino monologue comparing himself to Batman, what actor do you want delivering it? Is this me first? It's or is you this, first. This yeah, is you me can first. take plenty of time as I did with take, that last question. Yeah. Yeah, that is something, because, man, I, I struggle through his movies, and you know what? If you're going to do this, I'm going to take the only actor that endlessly entertains me in Quentin Tarantino, Quentin Tarantino movies, because this movie's going to be ridiculous anyway. Get Sam Jackson in there. Let him run with it. It'll be amazing. And, and, and it'll be no less ridiculous than anything else that happens in a Tarantino movie. Intriguing. 
Maya. I'm going to take uh, Matthew McConaughey simply on his uh, his performance in um, in True Detective. Those long monologues that he gave give a sort of creepiness that I think you need for Charles Manson, and so he's proven that he can do that in his career, and he's still pretty hot. I mean, as far as like his career is is still going well, and he's um, still got that respect, and I think it, it's something that he could he could do well. Charles Manson with a Southern accent. Hey. All right, all right, all right. I that's that right there just hints at why I'm picking Maya's answer yeah. here. Because who doesn't want to see Matthew McConaughey play Charles Manson as Wooderson? Oh, yeah, that would be good. So, and, and that actually is better than my answer, which was Paul Rudd. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are now tied 2 2. And uh, this is coming to you, Maya. So, uh, yesterday, because we recorded this on Thursday, and the Quakes played the Seattle Sounders on Wednesday, and in what has become an embarrassingly routine fashion, lost. So, I'm pretty bitter about this still, and we needed a soccer-related question. So, I want to know, who has the worst fan base? The Seattle Sounders, Atlanta United, or the Green Bay Packers? Okay, what I'm going to say here is going to be between you, Luke, me, and the rest of the world on the internet. I have not enjoyed my time here in Wisconsin as a Packer fan. I've been embarrassed by by the way that we treat people and by the arrogance with which we often have an attitude towards the football, just like a sense of entitlement. It was very different growing up when I was a kid before the Packers were ever good. I mean, they were obviously good, you know, in the sixties, but, but for my framework with the, you know, Don Mikowski's 10 and six season was the first season where I was like, Holy crap, the Packers can be good. And I like that sort of underdog and that small town feel, but there's so much of the fandom that's shtick now. And it's just, it's it's kind of entitled, where where people you'll get, if after a couple bad games, they'll be like, you should bench Aaron Rodgers, or you should fire Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy and Aaron Rodgers are two of the best things that have ever happened to this to the state's football team, and I just don't think they're appreciated, and I'm kind of embarrassed. And so I'm going to go with, with my own group here. I've, I've been embarrassed several times. I won't even listen to talk radio here in Wisconsin anymore. Well, this is going to be a, a round of, of surprises. Because as much as I loathe Packer fandom and, and have a hard time actually even in joking about it because I've had uh, bottles thrown at my two children when they were two and four because they were dressed in purple uh, by strangers, um, I, I'm actually for the sake of fun and this thing going to talk yeah going to talk about Sounders fans because Sounders fans don't earn anything they just assume they're entitled to everything and and the one thing I'll give the Packer fans a pass in is is. What the hell else do we have going for us here in Wisconsin? So of course you have to put all your self esteem into that. I mean Giannis, the other the Giannis. other the other thing we're really known for is having uh, people that eat other people in our state. <laughs> so so of course you're gonna focus on y'all, on your. Y'all thought that was a Jeffrey Dahmer joke, but that's actually Ed Gein bringing it back old school. Yeah, pick either one. So of course everyone here has to put all their self esteem into that because God forbid we talk about that or insulin shots or whatever else we have to deal with here. Seattle, you got a lot of good stuff going on for you. You are a a, a, fu- a a fantastic cultural you know epicenter. You got great music. You have other sports franchises. Like, d- don't sell out a stadium and then act like you're the greatest thing to happen to U.S. soccer. So I, I'm going to throw it at Sounders fans. Um. Okay. Well, that that was a little bit of a surprise. Um. Actually. I am giving the point to myself because I got recorded proof of my bashing something related to the Packers. So that's a win for me. And, and we now have new bumpers for every show that we're going to pull out of there. So right. so we're coming into question seven here. The score oh. stands at Luke 2, Maya 2, and me 1. <laughs> we're going to lose. So here's the, here's the tiebreaker. Okay. Now, this is a, a slightly different question than the other ones. This I'm glad is a you're going to call in response. I'm going to feed you a line, and then you have to give me the correct response. Okay? Yes. 
Okay. I love it already. So I'm I'm first. You're first. But you're also the champion, so I'm gonna switch this up. I'm giving it to Maya. First. Okay. All right. Well, that sucks for me. All right. Fair enough. All right. Are you ready? I hope so. Okay. Here it goes. Gotta see if I can say this without laughing. <laughs> I'm able with the cable. I've got the noose in my caboose. I don't know. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. I've got the noose in the caboose. That is uh, Jerem- That is Maya's answer. I'm, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the phrase for me one more time? I'm able with the cable. I bet you are. Whoa! The champ comes out again. I don't yes. know if that's in reference. Right? Then you need to go with Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> oh, that's right. You we did. Oh, I forgot there was going to be a Tales from the Crypt episode. Oh, right. oh yes, yes. I think you better. And, start and the up. minute the minute he said call and response, I knew exactly what the answer was. And I knew he knew. I'm, I'm not going to lie. This is some Putin level collusion yeah. that may have gone on here. But you know what? There's no VAR, so the. Title stays with Luke. Five for five. Alright, we should get to questions that kids seriously got. Hey, Javier in SoCal writes, Guys, did you hear that John Schnepp from Metalocalypse? Yeah. And Collider Heroes died. Lame. Did you guys have, do you guys know John Schnepp or did you follow that at all? I, I don't know of him or that he died but i do know metalocalypse he was he was the director on metalocalypse and he also uh directed a movie called a documentary called the death of superman lives which is about the failed tim burton superman starring nicholas cage and he did some comic book writing yep but uh, I know him specifically because I was uh, a really big fan, thanks to you, Maya, of Collider Nightmares, which was uh, a YouTube show every well every week for a while before it got gotten rid of that uh, just talked about the horror movie genre. So they had reviews and things, and and it was four personalities. And uh, what was awesome about him and that show is that you would I would actually watch it with a notepad. Because being a big horror fan, because they would talk about the current movies and you knew that they were coming out, but those movies would get them to discuss all of these other movies that they had seen that those reminded them of, and I would just be constantly writing down names of movies I have uh, never heard of, and then going and finding them on an Amazon Prime or Netflix or wherever, and he was the best for finding just the most gross, bizarre, abstract movies from Turkey or wherever that you had you would never stumble upon on your own. Uh, so I, I really enjoyed that show from, you know, it's not like I knew him or, or listened to Collider Heroes, which was more his main focus, which was a superhero movie show, but he seemed like a very affable man. Um, and you know, I think it was like 51. So, uh, you know, it's never good when something like that happens. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead, Mark. No, I'll just say that's sad. And I'm going to look up some of this stuff now. I'm, I'm intrigued. Yeah, the first the first time I saw him, he did an animated version of Black Panther. I think it was six episodes that he was the director for, and uh, really enjoyed that. Saw him on on Collider Movie Talk first, and then later Collider Collider Heroes, where he was uh, the host. and And I love John Schnapp. I, I think his his passion for comic books, especially really really weird, like he loved just really really weird stuff. Like he'd get him going talking about Doctor Strange and some of the crazy psychedelic stuff, and that was right up his alley. And sort of his his love for something that I loved was something that made made me tune in every week. And you know, I, I I'm sad. No other way to say it. It's a bummer. He's an awesome dude. So with uh, with that, um, in honor of John Schnepp. Uh, We'll move to our next segment, uh, which is the next Clone Wars episode. We're at Season 2, Episode 2. This is Cargo of Doom. Overconfidence is the most dangerous form of carelessness. Written by George Christick, this episode is di- directed by Rob Coleman, and it follows Anakin and Ahsoka attempting to get the holochrome back from the evil Cad Bane in an adventure that comes off the heels of the last episode. Luke! Take it away. 
So the narration here was kind of a jolt. It starts out maybe doing two lines of recap of the left last episode where Cad Bane had stolen the holochrome and he was off to go find uh, Ropal, who was this Jedi that looks like Greedo uh, that had some more information on these children that are force sensitive. But what we find out in the narration then is that he has actually already found him, gotten that information, though he can't unlock it, and has captured him. And the Jedi are in pursuit, and Anakin and Ahsoka are on a starship when they run into them. Quick question. Um, at the end of last episode, didn't he have like a 15-minute head start? Yeah. And so how, how did he go from that to flying halfway across the universe, capturing this guy, and then already being pursued by the Jedi. Because they probably had to have a committee meeting to decide there was a about who should go. And... Circle. There are lots of circles. To bring it back to John <laughs> Jeanette, like half the movie is standing in a circle talking about stuff. <laughs> yeah, for... You would have to spend a week meditating on it. Right. Exactly. Before they decide. But Anakin and uh, Ahsoka are there when we start the episode on a, a star cruiser and they are battling separatist star cruisers which Cad Bane is on so we find out his benefactors are Newt Gunray and Arsidious which for me was a little bit of a letdown because even though Cad Bane is kind of his own thing he's not a loyal separatist by any means I thought maybe we were starting to see a larger world at play that we were diving into but it's just kind of the same evil bad guys at the end. Uh, he has Rapal captured on his ship, and he needs him to open the holochrome because only Jedi can do that. So he has him imprisoned and tortured by battle droids. I was a little disappointed, and we're going to get to the torture because that's that's something that we're going to spend some time on, but I was disappointed that Master Rapal is a Rodian. We had, in about halfway through Season 1, there was an entire episode where there was a, a Rodian youngling, or, or maybe actually he'd just become a, a Jedi Knight. I can't remember offhand. And I kind of want there to be more representation of aliens. It felt like, oh, this is this is the Greedo alien, and we just keep going back to it. I kind of wanted something new or something a little bit more obscure um, than that. Well, luckily he doesn't last too long, so yeah. you didn't have to suffer through it for too long because he is very quickly murdered by Bane, who continues to torture him for information and is not that upset. Holy so Holy crap, there was a straight-up torture scene where someone died, and they showed all of it. This took all the fear that I had in watching A New Hope as a child or in watching Empire Strikes Back for those torture scenes, and to do you honors from our earlier segment, it took it to 11. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was not directed by Christopher Guest, by the way. But oh, was it? It was not. He's just in it. Rob Reiner directed that. But uh, I did say that this was going to be pedantic. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it was it was a it was dark from the get go in that aspect. So you knew exactly what you were doing. But it also reminded me of the movies because we talk about how Lucas envisions all these movies as kids as kids movies, but they're dark movies when you really get down to it with all the hand cutting and. You know, they torture Solo, not for as long as we see this poor guy tortured Never for. even asked me any questions. Yeah, exactly. But it was it, it was something to open up on. Uh, and this really bothered me, not because it's dark and this is a kid's show, but because it so clearly was done solely for the purpose of setting up the rest of this episode, which you'll get to later, um, that it it kind of took me out of the character a little bit. That, oh, okay, he's just kind of so dumb and cruel and casual that he just basically blows his best chance at uh, opening this holocron thing by, you know, cranking it to 11. Yeah, and, and it was weird, too, because as you kind of mentioned, it feels like they cut out an episode to, to skip here. So we never even really got a feel for uh, what Rapal was doing. In defense of Cad Bane, if I may, this is a guy who in two episode, episodes has presided over two Jedi who have been dead. He has stood over their corpses. And so um, I would say that maybe Cad Bane doesn't give a crap. Like, he's just going to find another Jedi and another Jedi and another Jedi. No, but the, the... No, because the first Jedi was killed for a specific purpose so that they could replace him. I'm not arguing that he's not a cruel guy. I'm not saying that, oh, he would feel bad about torturing him to death. I'm just saying if presenting him as a competent antagonist, it's hurt by him so kind of casually just not paying attention to what he's doing, essentially, and killing what is his best chance. I would have thought he'd be smarter than this, that he'd be more in control of himself. 
that's a more interesting villain and, and a better threat than some guy who just kind of loses it. And this could be a byproduct of you being a casual Star Wars fan who's just jumping into the show versus <laughs> us who've been watching this whole show because we're used to these villains being completely incompetent and bumbling from mm-hmm. start to finish. Even ones that are represented well in the movies, like Grievous, are just completely inept in this series. So that didn't hit me because I spent most of the time thinking this is a villain who actually is accomplishing what he's trying to do for yeah. once. And doing it in a very scary manner. Yeah. So so Bane kills Rapal because he just thinks he can torture him and he'll eventually talk, but he doesn't, so he just dies and succumbs from the torture. The other thing I noticed from this is that the battle droids were not joking around, which they normally are. Now, they do later on in the episode, but they are very serious in tone here, which was something that I liked, and I thought it was a good way to do this because, obviously, the scene is very, very dark, and it made it more consistent a tone to have them not be making you know, slapstick comedy routines while this is going on. So Anakin and Ahsoka decide they need to get on the ship and try and free him because they don't know he is dead. They disable the hyperdrive by shooting the ship. And then they do uh, something a little interesting because they don't really have any ships to get over there. So they take AT, uh, what is it? ATA 300s, I believe is what they call the tiny walkers. And they have magnetic feet. They load up with clone troopers and they send them on to the Separatist ship. And thank God this settles once and for all the AT-AT debate. I am so annoyed when people call walkers at ads. It shouldn't matter to me, but like face masks and football and Luke's misunderstanding of the word ambivalence, this matters a lot to me for some reason. And I'm They am- are AT-ATs, they are not at ads. And I'm ambivalent about the pronunciation, so it's fine. Um, and anyway, so, but this was kind of an interesting battle sequence because the walkers are walking on the surface of the ship and the Jedi are out there with helmets and stuff on. And Mark, just we had a, helmets, just helmets. But no, them. no, we had a breakthrough. We had a breakthrough, a major character breakthrough, and I hope it sticks. Yes, the, so Ahsoka got a full costume when she went into space. Now she did start in her tube top when they were on the ship, but for the rest of the episode, she was in a full shirt, like an actual yeah, that, soldier would. Mary Poppins, Leia, eat your heart out. At least this time, the Skywalker has a helmet. Well, and I thought this was a fun battle, to be honest. It was a different way to do a battle. You can tell how much they've improved the budget, because the the ships and everything are so much more detailed than they used to be. So It's it's hard to do something new, and this and then the next scene are things that we have not seen in this series, and we have not seen in Star Wars. And you're, you're right, that makes it fun. Yeah, and they even lightsaber fought out there as well. So I, I enjoyed that sequence and they end up gaining access to the ship with some of the clone troopers that they brought with. So Bane starts a self-destruct sequence on the ship and is kind of making his plan knowing he needs another Jedi because that's the only way to open the holochrome. And the ship starts to kind of separate and self-destruct and Anakin and Ahsoka find Rapal, find out that he's dead. They're obviously very upset because uh, sometimes they're upset when Jedi and clones get killed and sometimes, sometimes they're, they're not. not. But this time they are. So, oh, and also in this sequence, Rex bangs his head on on the, the I thing. missed that. Oh, he, he, he bangs his head on something and then they turn their night vision on. But I, it, I, it had to have been a clear episode for that Stormtrooper bumps his head shout out. One question that I had is those canisters that were exploding everywhere. At first, I thought that those were the canisters from Solo. Like, maybe Solo was shouting out to this episode. Did you catch what those were? Were those, like, missiles? Or were they for the hyperdrive? Or those missiles that kept exploding? I miss what they They episode. said, but I honestly don't recall what they were other than that they were explosives. They certainly didn't say coaxium because that would have jumped out at me. Right. But, yeah, there are some canisters floating in because we have a giant battle in the hangar bay between the tropes and the, the troops and the, the clones. And uh, Cad Bane, they kill the gravity in this, which also made the fight a little bit more interesting and unique than just people blasting at each other. So they're floating around and some have magnetic boots and Anakin is about to get the holochrome, but they turn the gravity on and he falls. I, I loved this battle because for me, I, you know, I tend to obsess about things a little more important than ad at versus AT-AT. <laughs> um, sure. In, in classic Knights of Fashion, the things you care about are obviously more important. Obviously. You may not realize this, but being a Californian, you know, my tastes are a little more sophisticated. Than Actually, you. as a former Californian, I do realize that. <laughs> um, but I love this sequence because it's for a show called, you know, Star Wars. It takes place amongst the stars. They never seem to pay attention to the fact that they're actually in space, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's sound in space in this universe. The lasers are visible when they would be 
you know, clear. Um, and there's always gravity. So it was really kind of cool for them to, you know, think, hey, you know what? Maybe we can play with the fact that we're actually in space and it could provide something different for a battle scene. I mean, granted, maybe they've done this before and I've never seen it in nope. the show. But, yeah, I, I just thought that was that was really cool and it made the battle a lot more exciting. Yeah, it was. It's it's one of the best battles they've had yeah. for me. I think it is the best. I can't think of one that's better. Yeah. So then, uh, Bane is able to lure Ahsoka away from the rest of the battle and is cut off in a hallway where it's just the two of them. And Anakin's kind of collapsed in some rubble. He realizes it's a, tra- a trap and doesn't want Ahsoka to go. So this sets up an Ahsoka Bane battle, which I enjoyed because Ahsoka whooped his ass in the actual fight portion of it and had him knocked down and on the ground, which was good because I didn't like the fact in the last episode that the changeling could hold her own against Ahsoka, but Bane was just smarter than her, and while he was kind of passed out on the floor, he grabbed her ankle and electroshocked her while she thought the battle was won and knocked her out. And my favorite thing about this is he snaps off her Padawan braid. He just rips it off. And yeah. that moment was my favorite moment of the whole episode. Yeah, it, 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 it was good. So then Anakin busts through finally, to go find them. Meanwhile, the whole ship is blowing up. So there's there's kind of a ticking clock, but that never really felt that tense. But Anakin is going after Ahsoka and the Holochrome. He finds Bane, who has Ahsoka locked in a cell. And obviously Anakin can kill Bane in a second. But what Bane says is, I have a button right here. And before you can reach me, I can press this button and blow Ahsoka out the airlock. So Anakin actually agrees and drops his lightsaber and opens the holochrome, which means Bane now has access to all of the information that is that they're trying to get on where these young force sensitive kids are. And then the list is in the open. <laughs> <laughs> in the open. <laughs> and then Bane and then Anakin does what you would think he does and tries to kill everyone, but Bane is a Bane hits the airlock to blow Ahsoka up and he uses that to escape. So Anakin uh, has to free Ahsoka, who's kind of holding on, and they manage to get out of there. Bane is confronted by some clone soldiers in a hallway, but then we kind of cut away from that, and the ship is really about to blow. So Anakin and Ahsoka decide to flee with the rest of the clone troopers and just let the hollow chrome blow up, assuming Bane is dead. One of the clone troopers. <laughs> shows up saying that he's okay and uh, he, he appears injured but he comes on the ship with them and they land back on their ship as the separatist one blows up and we see that one clone trooper who, who seems like he might be hurt but he probably was there when they killed bane well and anakin says he you can... know, bane is dead but i can still feel him yeah that means he's not dead right yeah <laughs> pretty much he wanders off, and then they talk about how, well, at least the the mission might have been kind of a failure from what they were trying to accomplish, but they stopped the holochrome info they, from getting out. And they still won, and that's what's important. One thing that occurred to me is, as this naval officer, as this admiral is talking crap to Anakin, I was totally like, it makes sense now why Darth Vader kills so many naval officers Like when they start talking yes. crap. like He just puts them down, so I was kind of on Anakin's side with that. Yeah, he, he bitches a lot, but this might be my favorite episode. This this is hit one of the major things that I complained about endlessly in the first season, and that was how weak they made their villains. The villains always lost. They always looked bumbling. No one was built up as a real threat because they were stopped every episode. And Bane has been now in three episodes, and he's basically won every single time. So they're building him up strong. He's a great, fun character. He wins in ways that make sense to me. It's because he's smarter. It's not just him trying to physically overpower the Jedi, and they're just not using the Force properly to beat him. I loved the action sequence in in Zero Gravity, like we talked about on the ship, and I loved the action sequence out on the ship. So this is a, a five pure for me. I was really excited about this episode, and I enjoyed that they had the darker tone and that they were consistently keeping that tone throughout the I think. I have a question. Yeah. Um, as a casual fan who has not seen many of these episodes, um, do they do the whole droid joke shtick in a lot of these uh, episodes? Everywhere that the the regular battle droids show up, they are really, really jokey and bumbling. Okay, because I I was really kind of surprised by that because for me that seemed like one of the kind of most obvious tonal flaws in the prequels that Lucas put in, that you had them as these sort of bumbling um, 
comic relief. Uh, and so I was really kind of surprised that that wasn't something that got dropped off in an effort to create this, what you know, I'm thinking is more serious, kind of darker toned show. Um, I mean, I swear to God, you know, I, half the time I expected to see, you know, Tom Servo pick up a blaster and start <laughs> shooting at him. I mean, Jesus, when they're not killing Jedis, they're probably silhouetted in front of Manos hands of Fader, teenagers <laughs> from outer space. It just, it really threw me off. Totally. It's interesting you say that. I think at the beginning of the series, it's very much a George Lucas focused project, and eventually, like as of today, it's a Dave Filoni project. And where Lucas ends and Filoni begins, I don't think is clear to me personally. I think a lot of the things in the first season are really, really Lucas influenced, mm-hmm. and and most people have said that that wanes over time, and maybe over his lack of interest in Filoni kind of picks it up but for someone who just finished the first season this this was i was impressed by how serious they were yeah wow okay yeah I'm probably not gonna go back and <laughs> see those episodes then no well you you came in at a good time uh the rumors are that the second season is quote unquote when it gets good for me this episode is obviously my favorite in this early season we're now what about 10 percent into the season and i think it's already got a big head start over the first season um with these two episodes i think this episode i would agree with what luke said it's way up there for me it was probably ranked two overall we're not going to do it that way um you know like i said after the second season i'll compare the second season to the first season and just keep my rankings for each season by season but it's obviously a number one uh early days here in the second season mark where what did i don't know what ranking system you want to go with we got the pews for your brother we got just the numbers for me uh thumbs up thumbs down i don't know what you want to do here well i i gave last episode if i remember correctly one meh yeah. so it might be beneficial to stick with that i'm gonna give this one at least three meh <laughs> you know I, it was it was it was Far superior to the last one. There was a lot in this I really did like. I didn't like the jokiness of the the droids. I didn't like Bane killing the Greedo alien because they needed to set up his having to take one of the other Jedi captive. Um, I felt that was really the action, the, the darker tone of it. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot more. All right, speaking of enjoyment, guys, it's time for other nerd news. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. All right, Luke, what's got you going in the world of nerddom this week? So I went to the fire game last week that I mentioned, which was interesting. We talked a ways back because Sector Latino, one of the two major groups, had been kicked out for violating the fan code of conduct which is very highly debated among uh, fans and whatnot. And in response, the other main fan group, Section 8, boycotted, which was done relatively effectively, but because of how they're organized and how little unity they have, some people still did show up and sit in the sections during the boycott. So I went to this game against Toronto, and it was Section 8 had decided to come back, and they had had Sector Latino with them, and they were all going to sit together in Section 8 because Sector Latino sits on the other half of the stadium in their own section, which is now being kept empty because they aren't allowed there. Is it still chained? It's not still chained, and at this game, I don't believe they put security along the lines anymore like they did for the first few games to keep people out of there. It's just kind of empty. And it was an interesting, interesting experience because I am in the middle on this whole issue. I don't think they are completely unwarranted for being punished, But I also think that the front office wants them out of there. So this was an interesting deal to see what Section 8 and Sector Latino were going to do. And the game started and they were completely silent except for a few people in there that apparently didn't get the memo and were doing some kind of chants on their own. So you're watching the game and the Toronto Traveling fans are doing audible chants and no one on the fire is really doing much of anything. And then you hit the 12th minute because Sector Latino, I believe, was founded in 2012. So it's like they're abbreviated as SL12. And all the groups joined in together enchanted and it was amazing it was the best atmosphere i've seen in there since quatamac blanco left the team back in i don't know 2009 2010 it was insane and part of me was sitting there going 
they're making a really good point here, a really good protest, showing what they can do and how they can help the team and how we shouldn't silence that voice. But part of me was also saying, man, if the front office's goal was really to make them all sit in one section so they can sell those corner kick tickets that Sector Latino has, they're also showing them how great they can be together because they have never sounded like that to me. And then they also, I'm up in the, the upper deck sky deck and I sit pretty close to the communications director of section eight she passed out leaflets to all the fans up there that were really well written that and i wish i would have kept it but it talked about this is why we weren't here this is why we were protesting this is what we're hoping to accomplish and it was like we want to iron out security issues we want to have meetings with management etc etc it was really well done and i was really impressed with what they were doing and then we got to i don't know eight to five minutes left in the game and a group of people led by Sector Latino people left Section 8 and stormed their old That's section right. and started started banging the drums and stuff from there. And my heart dropped. It absolutely dropped. And then Monterey Security went over there and there were some exchanges with them. And it sounds like it may have been a fan in another section that actually ended up bearing the brunt of abuse. But in my head, I was just sitting there going, you guys just put together a really well-organized huge protest that really demonstrated the power of what you can do when you're motivated and together and working and now you've thrown it all away in the last few minutes to just kind of storm this section which i'm sure felt really gratifying but now you are playing into all the bad things that fire management is saying about you that you're a threat to security that you refuse to follow the rules that you just want to do what you want and also it really hurt the game because we were the fire were down by a goal and they sucked all the fans away because, first of all, it was a lot quieter when they're spread out. And a lot of the fans were distracted watching them instead of cheering the fire on as they're trying to rally to get a tie. So I, I just have to say that, I, man, for someone who doesn't have a lot of faith in what sector Section 8 and Sector Latino would be able to pull together, to do it so perfectly for 85 minutes and throw it all away was so disappointing. And I really wonder if we're, we're going to... We're seeing the end of these groups all together in, in the not too distant future and what that'll be like and what might grow out of that. Hopefully there are some positives that grow out of that. But man, I just that was that was something. I'm glad I didn't turn those tickets in because it was something to behold. The uh, the the clutching defeat from the jaws of victory is very much a Chicago Fire sort of thing. But I think you're onto something. The Barrio Brava, um, the greatest section uh, or the greatest uh, supporters group, in my opinion, for the DC United, have also gotten the same treat treatment where they've been kicked out and weren't allowed to Audi Field for DC United. So I I wonder if there is. And they're well, they're back in now. Or are they? They've are they ironed back? they've ironed that all out because they were diplomatic and they went to the table and i don't know if the fire ownership is willing to do that but if you're just sound like they are it doesn't sound like they are at all but if your your fans are just going to raid sections that they know they're not supposed to be in and then claim their victims oh, man you just you threw everything you had to bargain with off the table yeah so uh, you two may not know about this but i have a really unique talent um when it comes to tv i'm able to zero in on the cultural zeitgeist roughly two to three seasons after shows already been on the air um, the rest of development, I came in between the second and third season. Uh, same with Sopranos, The Wire, Seinfeld, Rick and Morty. Um, really, the only time I've ever got in on the ground floor was Homicide, Life on the Street, back in 93, I think. Right. So, in keeping with that trend, my wife and I have finally started binging The Handmaid's Tale on Hulu. And I'm uh, going to drop another real hot take here, but it's really, really good. Uh, <laughs> Where are you in it right now? Are, I'm sorry, say that again. Where are you? Are you still in the first season, or are you? We're still in the first okay. season. We're almost to the end of the first season. So I, I watched the first season, and it was really good, but with the, the times we're currently living in and the, the thought in my head of Mike Pence beating off to being Joseph Fiennes, uh, I, it, it's so grim and dire that I just haven't been able to start the second season because it's like you have to mentally prepare yourself to handle that. I remember there was one episode in the first season where I was like, oh my god, we went 60 minutes and no one got raped that episode. I'm so relieved. <laughs> you're, you're really touching on what, what I was going to get into, which is about what was affecting me most about it. Because, you know, you go in and you think, okay, I'm going to be seeing this Christian dystopia and, you know, there's all this rape and brutality. And, I mean, it, it really is brutal, but for me... Because they're in costumes, because they're using funny names, 
I, there's a certain kind of removal from it. Um, you, you know, getting the feeling, like, oh, okay, I'm watching fiction. I'm watching brutal, horrible fiction that's telling uh, an important story with a good message, but it's not real. Um, but what's been really getting me is when they do the flashbacks. Yeah. Uh, when they're showing the characters before the country falls and they're living their lives, you know, lives which are just like ours. And just in little ways, you see the fascism creeping in. Like when two women go to a Starbucks and they're wearing workout clothes and the barista calls them sluts and refuses to serve them. Um, you know, or when they're, the, the main character, June, goes to the hospital, and this isn't really a spoiler for anybody who's listening and cares, but she goes to the hospital because her daughter got sick at school and they had to call an ambulance to take her there. And the caseworker is talking to her and starts asking her kind of, you know, the average questions, oh, you know, who takes care of her, blah, blah, but then starts getting a little more serious and like, well, don't you think you should be home with your daughter instead of working? And it just how these normal interactions can so quickly turn into a situation where you're helpless and where you realize that you don't necessarily have a ton of power. Um, it, that's really, you know, like you said, with the people in power, with people in power right now, that's what's really been affecting me and really kind of staying with me and making me uneasy. And that was not at all what I was expecting. Um, but yeah, so we're still continuing to watch it and uh, good stuff. And, and Anne Dowd is, I know she won an Emmy, but she is one of the most underappreciated actresses that we have right now. I mean, True Detective, The Leftovers, Handmaid's Tale, she's in a ton of stuff. And man, she Which is just is she? awesome. She is uh, the, she is the head, the head of, she's like the head, a head priestess. I don't even know what her title is that always, always gathers all the, the girls up. And, She's Aunt Lydia? Yeah, and yells that at him. Oh, that hateful bitch. Yes, yes. And, and oh. Who's she playing True Detective? True she's the wife? Of she the is the wife uh, in the last episode, uh, which I don't want to spoil. So I'll just say she's only in that last episode, but she is the wife. Uh, the, the Leftovers, which I will contend is the second best show in the history of television next to Frisky Dingo. Uh, she is She's massive in that as well. Uh, she is she is. Awesome. She's the wife in True Detective. Is that what you mean? She's the she's the wife of one of the uh, of a character that's only really in the last episode okay. of True Detective. So she has a really big part in the last episode, but oh, okay. she is not in the rest of I the series. You. I got you. Yeah, no, she's fantastic, and she was actually was almost what I was going to talk about because I the other thing that the show's really made me think about is how to craft truly hateful villains because it is very rare that I have read a book or watched a TV show or a movie where I am actively on the edge of my seat hoping somebody stabs a character. <laughs> yeah. And I am just dying, just dying for one of these handmaids to take a homemade shiv and just stick it right in her gut. Yep. Her and, and her and David Tennant and Jessica Jones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, there's another one. And, yeah, and it, it, so, you know, that got me thinking about, you know, how you make, you know, truly quality villains. And, and you know, I think the aspect that they bring is, you know, these people who think they're heroes, that that's, that's kind of the worst villain is people who think they're heroes and that's, that's her. So yeah. Yeah. I was not expecting to like the show as much as I did or as I am, but yeah. Speaking of villains who think that they're the hero, the third season of Last Chance You came out on Netflix on uh, July 20th, and it's something I binge and always get done with it in just a couple days. Show us about college football players who, for whatever reason, have ended up in junior college in an attempt to try to get back into a major college and then go on to the NFL. Does what? Andrew Elizondo coach them? Damn it, I had a Scott Bakula comment, and I knew I was going to have to fight you for it. I'm, I'm going here, guys. Sorry, go ahead. This is my time. Sorry. This Ka is my time. Kathy Ireland for kicker. Oh, that, hey, that is hey, a great hey, episode. There's always time. time for a necessary roughness reference. So they That's Sinbad, for God's sakes. <laughs> Fumbalaya! <laughs> Fumbaluskia! They go to junior college in an attempt to get back into major college and then hopefully go on to the NFL. Now, the first two seasons are all about a team in East Mississippi, um, but this year they went with a new team in in, in 
Independence, Kansas, and the show is just a goddamn dumpster fire. The main villains are a coach who curses at his players every chance he gets. He swears so much that you literally cannot keep track of it and tells us all that he really cares about the kids. He just apparently by swearing at them and cursing them out and mother effing them. And then you got the quarterback, Malik Henry, who is subverting the coach at every step, solidifying his reputation for being a team cancer. If you like train wrecks, check out Last Is Chance this a again. reality show? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, that brings a whole new element to it. Yeah. I was thinking it was scripted no, at no, first it's, type it's, thing. It's okay. Yeah, I was going to ask if it was a comedy or a drama. Or no, a drama. It's, a, it's a real, real life. Wow, I just could imagine, too, the, the delusions of importance that you would find among a lot of those people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like they do something important like a Star Wars podcast in a basement. Mm-hmm. So, like, the you know, the inflated egos that must be banging together in those places has got to be something. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's something to behold. It really kind of, you know, puts things in perspective. Alternatively, what makes the show that I that I watch each time it comes out is a lot of these stories of these kids who are really struggling, um, have grown up in really bad situations and are putting it all on the line and sacrificing their bodies to try to make it to the NFL to help their families out. And that's something that appeals to me. So there's good parts in the show, but holy crap, Coach Brown is a real turd nugget. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Speaking of turd nuggets, that's about all for us. Luke Neitzel, where can they find you? Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L on Twitter. For me, I'm at Maya Madrid at Twitter. And uh, Mark, are you still not being contacted? Are you still, uh, what's the deal with uh, well, you? Well, you see, I'm, I'm going to get on the Twitter uh, but first, I am taking a long decontamination shower type scrub to all of my social media because I don't need to be the next James Gunn. Fair enough. So right now, no, you can't find me. All right. In the words of uh, James Gunn, I'm out of here. See you later. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at kidsseriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.